Hello and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Joel Moran Show. I'm joined here by John Tortorelli and today we're going to talk about the Knicks and Raptors trade. We now have one game under our belts to go off of with the Knicks and OG Ananobi and the Raptors with Emmanuel Quickly and RJ Barrett. Previewing the Bills and Dolphins matchup, can we trust either of these two teams with how things have gone lately? And then we're going to end off the show. By talking about Lamar Jackson being a two-time MVP, which he probably will be, the odds are in his favor by a significant amount. And where that puts him amongst the quarterback hierarchy, not just right now, but all time. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great. You got a good topic last day, Nick's NFL and NBA, and thank you for having me on. Now, I want to have you want to talk about this Knicks and Raptors trade first, Mm -hmm. because... When the first when the trade first happened, I, I very much was distraught. I thought it was an awful trade for the Knicks because Emmanuel quickly left. And I have more of an emotional attachment to quickly than I do RJ Barrett because I was just kind of tired of RJ Barrett. I'll be honest. But quickly, you can see that there's a lot of potential there that he probably was never going to live up to with the Knicks because he's always going to be a backup. I like this trade for both sides. I think OG and Anobi fits with the Knicks much more. We need a wing defender. I think the timing of this trade was very telling after SGA and Jalen Williams both dropped 36 on us. Then Paolo goes for 29. Franz goes for 32. I I think this trade was made when we were unable to stop players on the perimeter and our rim protection isn't there since Mitchell Robinson is hurt. I think OG's a great fit. And with the Raptors, I mean, RJ Barrett gets a fresh start. I I think he gets to play for his home country. That's always a great thing. And Emmanuel quickly gets to get a bigger role, and that's what he's wanted all along. How do you feel about the trade? I said when it first happens that everyone likes to shit on the Knicks whenever they make a big blockbuster move. This wasn't blockbuster, and that's the reason why people are so disappointed. But OG and Anobi brings just about everything RJ Barrett did not. Barrett's not a good corner shooter. OG the last three years shoots 46, 47% from the corners. Barrett's what, a solid, average defender? OG's probably the best isolation defender in basketball. And the biggest thing with R.J. Barrett, because I felt like a lot of Nick fans are more inclined on quickly being traded. That was the disappointing part. R.J. Barrett's not a very good player, at least not in New York. I know on the show, Drew loves to defend him especially. I'm sorry, Drew. I'm going to come at him. Barrett's not a good finisher. He's not an efficient scorer. He can't score at all in the mid-range. The stats, he shoots 33% there. He's a average at best three-point shooter. And it felt like New York was limiting Brunson and Randall because RJ was a poor fit. And that was what partially stagnated his development over the years. Part of it is, I don't think he's the most versatile player, but also, what does RJ do best? He's a transition scorer, and the Knicks don't run. Within a Nobi, he brings everything you would want on a contending team. And it's the same exact way people hate on the Andrew Wiggins trade when the Warriors moved on from D'Lo. They didn't really need D'Lo. The same way that the Rockets got a lot of flack. Dylan Brooks comes in, and they've had the largest defensive turnaround so far through 30 games in NBA history. And then I think of Aaron Gordon in Denver. They gave up on Gary Harris because he was injured often and a first-round pick, which I think became R.J. Hampton as well. All of those trades work out, but the difference is Ananobi might be the best player because he fits in every single lineup. I felt the Knicks probably would get a B-plus in this move, and the reason why I wouldn't get an A is because quickly – should have been put in the starting lineup for a longer period of time. Because so many people right now think he's going to come to Toronto and be a great lead guard. To me, you want to find out who he is as a player by putting him alongside Brunson in the starting lineup. And I felt the issue was that Tom Thibodeau did not want to do that because he's a stubborn head coach. If they had at least seen him in the lineup and said, okay, he's probably going to be a second or third guard, it would have made this trade a lot more safe with less risk if quickly pops into a multi-time all-star, let's say. Our best lineups were with, with Emmanuel quickly in the starting lineup, or not our lineup, but when he played with our Mr. starters, Kobe. that was our best lineup. He has the best plus minus in Knicks history for any player ever. That's which crazy. is an odd stat. Emmanuel quickly is amazing, and I think he's going to flourish with the Raptors. But the thing about it is that even with the sample size we have of him succeeding with the starting lineup, you have to ask the question well, how far can this go? 
if you have Brunson and IQ who are both undersized guards and you don't have a premier wing defender, you're counting on Josh Hart or another small ball lineup of Dante DiFincenzo to come in and defend opposing players. Now you're at a disadvantage. Emmanuel quickly is a great defender's numbers will show that as well. But when you watch games, you understand that he's just too small to defend certain guys. I mean, Manuel quickly will not be able to defend Jason Tatum. He won't be able to defend Jalen Brown. He's a great point of attack defender that can defend guards, but size is a real thing and he's going to get bullied. And there's a reason why we traded for a bigger wing. So I think the Knicks saw that and they just never liked the idea of a small ball lineup. And even now, like thinking of the Knicks trading for Donovan Mitchell, mm -hmm. It's cool because Mitchell brings us more juice, but I'm also not a very big fan of that miniature backcourt. I want right. someone that has more star Thanks, power to them to actually elevate this team because I think Donovan Mitchell has plateaued as yeah. a player for the most part. He's an excellent player, but I think he's more so the second option on a, on a championship team. But Emmanuel quickly, and people forget this, is that he was terrible in the playoffs. He was bad. Before he getting was, hurt, too. He was borderline unplayable. He he, We could not have him in the game. So <laughs> we saw that, and I think we've seen him in the playoffs two times already. His rookie season and this past season. You're three. In 2023. Yeah. I think that's a large enough sample size for you to make a determination on if a guy right. translates to the playoffs or not. And I don't think the Knicks were able to take the risk of, well, maybe quickly does play well in the playoffs this time around. They needed to go get somebody like OG, who they know at the very least is going to provide a high floor because of his defense. And with quickly, I think it's overly optimistic to say he's going to break out like Tyrese Maxey. And I've seen that a lot because the Raptors don't have anything. And when you don't have anything, the expectations do sometimes become unrealistic. The Tyrese Maxey breakout is one of the most rare we've seen because he became an awesome shooter, a good isolation score, a capable isolation score, and a good playmaker. All of those things need to happen, and that usually does not for most guards. And specifically with quickly in the playoffs, I felt a large part of his struggles were that he's not the type of isolation score to be a lead guard. And he's probably best off as an awesome six man that can close for you. He can at times give you eight points in a two minute span to really change a playoff game. But we saw in his rookie year, Derrick Rose was the only person in that offense who could create something when they went the quickly. He didn't bring anything more than Alec Burks. And I get he was a rookie, but we've seen multiple different occasions where there is a clear need for that shot creator to be the third option. And I know a lot of Nick fans are now disturbed because they're thinking, if OG and Obi is the third best player on our team, we don't have enough. But to me, this trade was an appetizer of what to come. The Knicks have five likely first round picks. They've got a six, which is kind of fake. So they can still make a big time trade. And the Donovan Mitchell point you laid out is true because so many people have had the conversation as Jalen Brunson, number one championship team. I definitely think he could lead the Knicks to a conference finals berth. But you would prefer him to be your number two. And when you look at the stars in the top 10, I look at Luca. I look at Joel Embiid. All of these players could be on the trade block at some point over the next two years. And I think the Knicks are still a very young team. Jalen Brunson's 27. He's not going to turn 28 until August. You've got four to six years. Julius Randle is 28 years old. There's not this rush to splurge on, as you've pointed out, Zach Levine for shits and giggles. There is an opportunity for them to be patient, waiting for the right move. And it's frustrating because it's like, People just want to say something about the Knicks. And I was on this boat. At one point, I said the Jalen Brunson move was an overpay. But then I started to think about it. And that summer, I'm like, it actually does make sense. And the more we've gone on, the more we've kind of fallen out of the realization, the Knicks are a well-run team. This was a smart move. And I think that overall, outside of the Obi Toppin draft pick, this front office has done a great job over the last four years, last three years. And the more they set themselves up to be one star away, the happier people are going to be when that star does become available. For every Rajon Rondo and John Wall, we get an Eric Bledsoe and a Brandon Knight. I know Kentucky guards tend to break out, but Tyrese Maxey was a very rare case. And right. I, I think when you look at these dynamic scoring guards, Tyrese Maxey, Tyler Hero, hey, Anthony Simons, oh. 
Jamal. Has, has jumped into the mix. Emmanuel quickly is very good. I don't know if he has the explosiveness in his game like Anthony Simons or Tyrese Maxey. And I don't know if he has kind of the feel for shot creation like Tyler Hero. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe he does get to a tier like that and he's, you know, a borderline all-star. I wouldn't put it past him. But I just don't think that the Knicks were able to pay two miniature guards 50 million combined and one of them is your backup. I think that yeah. they they couldn't do that like it just doesn't make sense and i think rj bear's contract wasn't wasn't good it was a negative asset it was he's a player with decent stats on a good team that didn't fit i, I think the knicks did a great job in, in this move i really do for the raptor side of things what are the odds Manuel quickly does become an all-star i say 25 percent in this eastern conference a one or two time all-star when you have players like jalen brunson Tyrese Maxey, Tyrese Halliburton, Trey Young, LaMelo Ball went healthy in the Eastern Conference. I think 25% is is realistic. And I, I think unless we see a massive breakout from quickly, mm -hmm. then it, it probably won't happen. He'll be kind of a, a good player, no all-star kind of guy, like Mike Conley, where you're just kind of stuck behind so many great right. guards in the Eastern Conference that you're just not making an all-star game. But I want to say this. Like, I'm excited about the Raptors' future. I think they needed to pick a direction quite clearly. Definitely. You have Scotty Barnes to build around. Uh, R.J. Barrett, maybe he can turn into something. We don't know. But I think now playing for his hometown, for his home country, I should say. Yes. He'll be much more motivated. There'll be much more of a spark. He's outside of a big-time media mm -hmm. uh, conglomerate pressure. like New York. And he may know quickly finally gets to have his opportunity. And I feel like this was another underrated thing about this trade is that I mean, when you look at the from when you look at it from this aspect, you know, people say, well, were the Knicks really going to lose Emmanuel quickly because they could have matched any offer sheet? Well, what if a team comes and they're like, well, we'll give Emmanuel quickly 110. four years, one hundred ten million dollars. And you have the Knicks have to make the decision. We have to pay this guy twenty five plus million a year. And Emmanuel quickly is not shy about it. He is open about wanting a bigger role. I mean, when when you are not only paying a player, but you are keeping a player that is honest about the situation he wants to be in, I think it's best for a team to give that player what he wants. Go and yeah. flourish in a situation that fits you. And I think that's an underrated part about this Knicks current front office Definitely. is that the trades that they have sent their players on have been two better situations for them. OB Toppin to the Pacers, RJ and IQ to the Raptors. I mean, they're sending their players out to flourish, not for dead. And I think that's good business. Without a doubt. And the last part is they're going to have to extend Brunson. So by making this move, you save the money and time. I'm not sure if they got a trade exception. We'll probably find that out in the later days. There's still so much flexibility. And so that's why I, I think overall for the Raptors themselves, this was perfect. They won their first round pick. They didn't want first rounders. If they got them, it would have been useless because you're not going to tank this year. Quickly, it's a great fit with Scotty Barnes. RJ is weird, and I really like to talk about him. Mainly it's because before ever playing an NBA game, his nickname was Star J, and he was labeled the king of New York. Like The expectations people placed on him were insane when I felt like he was coming off a pretty disappointing uh, freshman season at Duke. I was like, I don't know if he's as good as everybody's making him out to be. But that being said, there's an opportunity for him to really develop. The Raptors head coach and Darko Ryakovich really emphasizes ball movement and good decision making. And RJ Barrett so often on drives gets this tunnel vision, but he's not the finisher or score to be able to at least do something with them. But if he's making quick decisions off these plays and they're playing at a faster pace, he's going to be more productive. And I think he's going to fit better once they eventually do move past Galciak. It's not a fit now, but the Ananobi trade was their sort of appetizer. Siakam's not going to be here next year. At least I would hope he gets put somewhere where it's the best thing for both sides. What are the odds that RJ Barrett becomes an all-star? Uh, 10%? 15? Uh, being a little generous there, John. <laughs> I mean, there's not as many Fords in the Eastern Conference. I mean, Paolo, Scotty, a couple of others. Franz. I think our position's deeper. I think Franz is a better player than RJ. But I don't know if he is the mid-range score to be this high 20s points per game guy. I well, think he's, he's 21 gonna, right now. 21 points per game. I don't know if he's going to be that much higher. 
So RJ could make one or two on a decent Raptors team where he's not going to be the most efficient player. But if he's averaging 25, I think it's possible. You know, given how the all-star voting works and how it's very fan-based reliant for the starters, I, I can see R.J. Barrett being an all-star starter, actually. I think I give that 70% because I think the whole country of Canada will make a whole PR move to vote him in as a starter when he averages 20 points per game one season, and he'll just get in by default. Yeah, that would be insane. As a Knicks fan, I've seen them be bad for a long time. So I'm happy with just being good. I think people forget that for the entire 2000s, the Knicks had the worst or second worst winning percentage of any team in the NBA. That's why I kind of get annoyed with everybody in the media that talk about the Knicks and they say that, well, we have to just go all in and make a move now. And what happened to just having a good basketball product on the floor and winning basketball games. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I think as long as we take, we keep taking steps forward to better ourselves, I think that's all that really matters. And I saw a comment about this trade and somebody said, as a Celtics fan, I fear the Raptors much more than the Knicks. And I don't, I didn't understand that. I was like, well, for one, as a Celtics fan, you shouldn't really fear both. You shouldn't feel fear either of them. But I'm sure you fear just Jalen Brunson in himself more than whatever the Raptors got going on. The truth is, is that these are two teams in two completely different situations. The Knicks need to have players fit around Brunson and Julius Randle. The Raptors are in a rebuild, and they never wanted to trade OG and an OB for straight up draft capital that was probably going to be late in the first round. They wanted at least a young player in return and i think they got more than that because they got a young player in quickly and then they got a player in rj barrett who is going to sell a lot of jerseys he is he may not be a great player but he's going to sell the jerseys and if they waited to the free agency market and an op declined his player option and they lost him for absolutely positively nothing the same way they did van fleet and i'm sorry lowry too because they just traded chua the main piece of that deal in this transaction, Masai Ujiri should have been fired. I, let me be very honest with you. To lose all three of those players for nothing would be a fireable offense. So, and that's after what he did in Denver too. I'm not naive. I just think he's done such a poor job in navigating this retool that there has to be like, there has to be something to come out of it. There's so many valuable players in the roster. And for the Knicks, the last part is there's nothing better. There's no better option or pathway to make them this championship contender without sacrificing a lot of risk for people to then dunk on them. So as a non nick fan, I get frustrated. I'm like, guys, this is the best possible thing, the best approach, and the best way to be patient. And it really just does seem like people are kind of out for them to fail, and so that's why they're pushing these narratives that they don't have enough star power. Or maybe Jalen Brunson, the Rick, the Becky Hammond, can he be big enough? I don't really care, to be honest with you. But it seems like so many different people have their own agendas. And it's for the Knicks not to sustain what they've currently built. The last point I want to make about this trade is that it's much easier to find a player to fill with Manuel Quickly's role than to find somebody like OG and Anobi. Yeah. People are very up in arms about the extension OG might get. Mikel Bridges didn't sign an extension. I believe he's up for contract, if I'm not mistaken. OG's not going to get more than Mikel Bridges. Mikel Bridges, with what he's done in Brooklyn, and I know he's taken a step back this year offensively. He struggled. I think Mikel should get about five to ten million more per year than OG and Anobi. I would say Mik more than that. Mikel is the person that I think kind of dictates dictates this three and D market. If he gets a little bit less than we're expecting. OG and Anobi could sign for a favorable deal back in New York. I, I think everybody's throwing around this $40 million per year number. But if it's 30 mil a year, I think that's fine. I for what it's a little bit too expensive for me, but I, I think it's fine. RJ it's Barrett's making fine contract. Exactly. And if, if RJ is getting that, then I think OG giving him that type of money is is totally good. And, yeah, I mentioned that it's just easier to find a sixth man. The Utah Jazz are trying to trade Jordan Clarkson. You know, will the Knicks be bidders in that? We don't know. But 
Jordan Clarkson can offer just as much as Emmanuel quickly. Mm -hmm. The Kings last offseason signed Malik Monk on a two year team friendly contract. Amazing. He broke out as a six man of the year candidate. Malcolm Brogdon last offseason was traded to the Celtics for virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. He won six man of the year. I mean, ob objectively, it is just way easier to find a six man. And it's easier to find veterans that are willing to accept that role. Uh, we the, uh, the an underrated part of this entire equation is that Emmanuel quickly was tired of just being a bench player. He wanted to be a starter. He wanted to have more opportunity. So I think it's better for the Knicks to just get players that want to buy into their role. Without a doubt. That Bones Highland for two second round picks. I think he'd be good. Yeah, for real. I, I think he would be good. And that would he wouldn't replace everything that quickly offered, but he, he, he probably replaced a lot. Bills and Dolphins week 18 matchup this weekend. The one burning question I have about this game is I don't know if I can trust either of these teams at this stage right now. The Dolphins have a lot of injuries. Bradley Chubb, they lost Jalen Phillips versus the Jets. Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waller dealing with lower leg injuries. Tua kind of injured his shoulder at the end of the Ravens game. Xavier Howard is dealing up, dealing with a little bit of an injury. I really want to make this Bill centric though, because after Ken Dorsey was fired, the Bills had a couple good offensive performances, and everybody jumped on the Ken Dorsey train about how he was so bad. He actually wasn't scapegoated. But past two games, they barely beat the Chargers 24 to 22. Their offense looked lethargic. And against the Patriots, they won 27 to 21. But the offense was terrible the entire game. And the only reason why the Bills won this one is because Bailey Zappi threw three interceptions in his own territory that led to a field goal, a field goal and a touchdown, and they had a fumble as well. So the, the Patriots had four turnovers in their own territory that led to Bill's scores. Mm -hmm. But if the if the Patriots were, were to take care of the ball this game, yeah. I don't think the Bills win it. The right. Bills were very much in danger of losing this one. And these stats kind of showcase how it hasn't been a big jump in offensive production. So since the Bills lost Ken Dorsey after week 11, their ninth in success rate, seventh in drawback EPA, 18th in drawback success rate, ninth, um, seventh in rush EPA, and fifth in success rate. Josh Allen is completing 57% of his passes compared to 70% with Ken Dorsey. Stephon Diggs in six games with Joe Brady calling plays has 228 receiving yards. That's how many yards he would have in a two-game stretch with Ken Dorsey. There are more playmakers getting involved with Buffalo right now, but you have to give your best player the ball. 228 yards in six games is not going to cut it. The Bills with Dorsey ranked first in success rate, eighth in dropback EPA, second in success rate from dropback perspective, second in rush EPA, and first in rush success rate. The offensive numbers with Ken Dorsey were up across the board. The rushing numbers per attempts per game and yards per game are up with Joe Brady, but the passing numbers are significantly down. And I'm looking at this offense and I'm saying, well, they kind of got a little bit lucky because they faced the Jets team that they're lifeless at this point. There are some games our defense shows up and there are others where they don't show up because they know the offense won't be able to do anything. They barely beat the Chiefs. Had Kadarius Tony not been lined up offsides, the Chiefs walk away from that field winning the game. You barely beat the Chargers. You barely beat the Patriots. The great big-time win was against the Dallas Cowboys where they dominated in every single fashion, but they didn't really dominate through the air. It was really a rushing attack that the rushing attack dominated. But I'm looking at the Bills, and I just – can we really trust them? Can we really be optimistic that they're just going to come out in week 18 and and light it up? The only right way you can put it is cautious optimism. Now, the Patriot game, I actually think the Patriots don't get enough credit. They have the best rush defense in football. They did that to my Steelers. They did it to a lot of teams where James Cook doesn't have a great day, less than 50 yards. 
you're not going to play them in the playoffs. Plus, New England knows this Buffalo team so well, and even if Belichick's kind of halfway out of it, halfway in it, they're going to put together a good defensive game plan either way. The issue to me has just been their defense is not the issue now. It's actually played quite fine. It's top five in, in scoring so far this year. In the playoffs, I think that's going to be an issue. It has in years past, partially due to the injuries. The, this, the criticism or the skepticism for me is if Buffalo loses and they have to be the six or seven seed going to Miami or Kansas City, they could be a first-round exit. And at the same exact time, if they win the division and they get the third or fourth seed, they can go to the entire way of the Super Bowl. They feel like the team with the far and away most volatility right now in football. I have seen Stephon Diggs disappear in playoff games. I've also seen moments where he's been a top five wide receiver in the regular season. Over the last seven weeks, Stephon Diggs' best game against the Eagles, six catches, 74 yards and a touchdown. Last two weeks, he hasn't put together over 29 yards. And if he's not clicking, and James Cook is sometimes clicking, where is the sustainability? Where is the consistency where the Bills can rely on this type of receiver or this type of running back or this type of skill position player to carry their offense to where it's not Josh Allen-centric? Buffalo, I think, has a very good case of winning the wild card round, but I have a hard time seeing them win three playoff games. And to me, part of it is they're going to need an offseason here, probably some coaching changes, uh, some defensive turnover, and ultimately finding some sustainability within uh, the run game and specifically whatever's going on with Stephon Diggs. I know he had a back injury in November, but it was taken off the injury report since then. And the big thing that's forgotten, too, is Buffalo at home last year nearly lost the Dolphins the third time they played without Tua even being on the field. So if Skylar Thompson can nearly beat Buffalo in a playoff game, I would have to imagine a third playoff matchup versus a divisional opponent now on the road would put the Bills in that type of water where it's it's possible you get knocked out by the Dolphins even if you beat them both times in the regular season. I think you're being really generous looking towards the playoffs only because if the Bills lose this game, they could miss the playoffs. If the Bills lose and the Steelers win against a Ravens team that has nothing to play for at this point, the Bills are going to miss the playoffs. So I think you're very generous even looking that far because they could miss the playoffs. As a Steeler fan, to be honest, I partially want them to make the playoffs. I partially also want to see the Bills in it. But I don't think we're actually going to believe they're losing on Sunday or on Saturday, whenever they do play the, the Dolphins. To me, Buffalo has had Miami's number for the longest time. And when Josh Allen's in the field, I expect him in a do or die elimination game because that's how Buffalo should handle it to play his absolute best. And for Stefan Diggs, too, there is a level of pride that goes into this game. Losing to Miami would be an embarrassment because this is a very winnable matchup. So to me, yes, it is possible, but the Bills are favored for a good reason. With the Dolphins not having either of their top two pass rushers, I'm giving Buffalo a 75% chance of winning this game. It's embarrassing for both sides because with the Dolphins, it's how did you choke away such a big lead to lose the AFC East? And with the Bills, it becomes how do you miss the playoffs when everything broke your way in order for you to make it? So both teams are at a peculiarly situation of being an embarrassment if they lose on Sunday. It's Sunday night football. It's going to be a great game. I can understand your confidence with the Bills. I, I do feel like some of their struggles do come when they face against lesser opponents. For some right. reason, they're a team that, plays down a competition but they can play up and not only play up but they can knock you out they're one of those teams that when they play those top teams in the league they are going for the knockout punch and they punch you in the throat and they tend to come away with those take that they tend to come away winning those matchups josh allen is dealing with a shoulder injury i think that's important to note his accuracy these past couple of weeks has has been very spotty i don't even think it's much of a joe brady thing i think it's just a josh allen thing Versus the Patriots, Stephon Diggs was wide open on a post, and it would have been a touchdown had Josh Allen hit him. A little bit inaccurate, and that would have been very friendly to Stephon Diggs' stats on the season, and he just missed them. So Josh Allen isn't playing the best either, and I think it's because he's kind of dealing with a little bit of in injuries. That's killed that MVP case for him. This is the season, and I was making it two weeks ago, but you expect Buffalo to give you confidence, and these last two weeks have made it 
seem like the same old Bills, as you stated. Kind of like the Cowboys. They're going to play up to competition. Well, actually, no, it's not true. The Cowboys it's don't December. It's usually. opposite. Yes, but the Cowboys also play down to the competition, which give you some false sense of belief. And I, I feel like you know, these last two games, they definitely do open up the door for Miami to, to have some confidence on their own part that, you know what, the Bills may be much better than us. They usually take care of us, but this is our season. So, Speaking about MVPs, Lamar Jackson is now the odds-on favorite to win MVP by a significant margin. And the question I have is, we're acknowledging him for this great season. He's been terrific. He's deserving of MVP. But the real question with Lamar Jackson comes in the playoffs because he is one and two in the playoffs. His playoff numbers are not good. Three touchdowns to five interceptions, 68.3 passer rating. He was eliminated as a heavy favorite versus the Titans back in 2019 when the Ravens were 14 and two. As a rookie, when he faced the Chargers, I don't really count that game much. And he got his get back against the Titans in 2020 when he beat them in a wild card. But then in the divisional round, he lost to the Bills. If Lamar Jackson were to go on a Super Super Bowl run this year, hypothetically, where does that put him in the quarterback hierarchy? How differently do we start to view him? It doesn't change where he ranks among NFL quarterbacks. Right now, he's one of the four superstars. He's a unanimous MVP. But it could change the entire way we look at the quarterback position. Because over the course of history, these mobile quarterbacks, these dual-threat quarterbacks, generally have not won Super Bowls. Cam Newton losing to the Broncos in devastating fashion. Jalen Hurts losing last year. Lamar is the chance to be the first one who is known for his athleticism primarily. Yet he breaks the stigma that these quarterbacks have attached to them that they can't win at all. You know, we've seen so many more pocket passers in the Brady's, the Stafford's, Mahomes, who have won way more often. And beyond that, the Ravens have not put a perfect supporting cast next to them. They put a great head coach, great offensive play designer. But you look at their wide receivers now, we're talking about it before. It's really not any better than 2019. Back then you had Mark Andrews, Willie Sneed, and Hollywood Brown. Now you have Zay Flowers, Isaiah Likely, and Gus Edwards. You know, that's like his fourth best receiving option some weeks. It seems like the defense is what makes Baltimore different than many years. Last year, they nearly beat the Bengals with Tyler Huntley playing. And I felt like with Lamar over the years, the common criticism was he wasn't healthy in December. The fact he's been able to stave off those criticisms, playing the entire year. Maybe he plays week 18. I would personally play him for a reason I'll get into later. It seems like he could be the first of his own kind. And, and quite frankly, that would, within five years, cement him as a Hall of Fame quarterback. Two MVPs, one unanimous, a Super Bowl win. But I think the Ravens have some work to do to get there. I don't think they should be a heads-on favorite because there's still a decent amount of questions with this team personally. I think Lamar Jackson has become a victim of his own talent and skill set. Because he is overwhelmingly possibly the best Russian quarterback to ever do it, it overshadows just how great of a passer he is. There are a ton of throws on tape that he makes with extraordinary power, accuracy, throwing from different arm angles. He's able to do it all. You mentioned the Russian quarterbacks that have not won. Jalen Hurts. I don't I think Jalen Hurts is a good passer. Not a great I wouldn't one. classify him as one of the better ones or an elite one. Cam Newton was very up and down and spotty. Yeah. Lamar Jackson is not any of those guys. I think Lamar Jackson is a consistent passer. He can very much win within the pocket. And this is the first time he's been in an NFL offense that is an actual NFL passing offense. With Greg Roman, as, as much of a wizard he was with his run designs, as a passing play caller and a designer, it was very basic and that's why Ravens fans had a lot of gripe with him as their offensive coordinator. This is the company that Lamar Jackson puts himself in when he wins his second NFL MVP. These are the only players in NFL history to win two MVPs. Jim Brown, Johnny Unitas, Joe Montana, Steve Young, Kurt Warner, Brett Favre, Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, and Patrick Mahomes. All of these players have won a Super Bowl, every single one. Or championship. 
Yes, Unitas, three-time Super Bowl champion. Jim Brown, one-time Super Bowl champion. Montana, four-time Super Bowl champion. Steve Young, three-time Super Bowl champion. Brett Favre, one-time Super Bowl champion. Aaron Rodgers, one-time. Peyton Manning, two-time Super Bowl champion. Mahomes, two-time Super Bowl champion, which is crazy given how young Mahomes is. He's already on trajectory to be one of the best ever. Brady, seven-time champion. Kurt Warner, one-time Super Bowl champion. Lamar Jackson, 58 and 19 record as a starter, one of the best winning percentages of any quarterback all time. If Lamar Jackson goes on a Super Bowl run this year with the resume that he's already built up, he's head and shoulders above every quarterback outside of Patrick Mahomes in terms of Hall of Fame resume. Oh he God, no. he jumps Russell Wilson. Oh, he jumps easily. Matthew Stafford. I love Matthew Stafford. But if Lamar Jackson wins a Super Bowl and he's a two-time MVP, yeah. that's a resume that Matthew Stafford just is not going to match up with. He doesn't even have the all pros to match up with Lamar, let alone, let alone the MVPs. If Lamar Jackson wins a Super Bowl, I mean, he's putting himself in some elite, elite company. Because the one thing missing is a playoff run. Like, it was the injuries in December, and then it's playoff performances. And I feel like the playoff numbers and the regular season numbers this year in his MVP year, they don't really reflect the type of player he is. This season, half of the Ravens' wins have come in blowouts versus San Francisco, Miami, Houston week one. And basically, every single team like the Lions we've tried to put on their levels, I didn't, I didn't do that. And it's because in those games, Lamar doesn't have to do a whole lot. He only has 24 passing touchdowns this year. Yet Gus Edwards has a dozen. Half of those have come on the goal line. And I feel like so often we're trying to like emphasize numbers in the MVP debate. It comes down to who's the best source of an elite offense. In 2019, the Ravens averaged 33 points a game, which is insane. They had 12 pro bowlers in that team, yes. But this year they've been able to replicate that without having the most gifted wide receivers that like, we got to emphasize it's Zay flowers and a bunch of role players. And Lamar is the force multiplier to make justice Hill, Gus Edwards, Mark Ingram, as good as, and as efficient as they have been to lose your top two running backs, to not have the absolute best pass protection that be missing your top 10 end. There are so many different things in the offense. He is able to solve and he does not have to be the most productive player to be the most important player on the field. And I, I, I kind of find weird a lot of the pushback with Lamar Jackson's numbers. 24 passing touchdowns this year is more than Jalen Hurts last year when he went 22 and 6. 22 passing touchdowns, six interceptions. Jalen Hurts, there are many people that thought that he should have won over Mahomes. And that's where winning bias comes into play. I think when when teams are winning and when a quarterback has the stats that are in the forefront of that winning, you ought to automatically overrate them and think that they have a better MVP case than another quarterback. And I think it's because in football, it's very hard to properly assess value unless you actually know what you're watching. Because with Lamar Jackson, you can pretty clearly see that he is the engine to his offense. Oh, but Brock Purdy has better numbers. Yeah, well, the knock against that is that Brock is not the engine of his offense. And maybe I'm being disrespectful here, but I think it's a pretty fair take. I think if Sam Darnold had started in the 49er system the entire oh, wow. year, does he have 30 passing touchdowns? Maybe not. But does Sam Darnold have 25 passing touchdowns? Does he have an above 100 passer rating? I mean, if Sam Darnold would put up awesome numbers. We saw Jimmy Garoppolo do it when this team didn't have CMC. In 2019, we saw Jimmy G have a top five EPA season ever and a 100 plus passer rating. And his best receiver was Emmanuel Sanders, who they got at the trade deadline. He didn't have him the entire year. So, I mean, we've seen this before. So that's why I think people just don't properly attribute value. And a lot of the award has come down to narratives and yeah. Lamar just had the best narrative down the stretch, even though I think he's very deserving of the MVP mm -hmm. beating the Niners and then beating the Dolphins. I mean, had, had those games gone either way, had the Niners beat the Ravens right now, Brock Purdy's the MVP of the NFL. 
it comes down to out of structure. Like there have been so many times like that 49ers game where there's nothing there in, and then he has to create the play. And that is the one concern I have in the postseason. When you're playing in Kansas City and they have elite cover corners and a good enough pass rush, the Ravens are going to have to ask Lamar to do a lot when the play breaks down that no other quarterback really can do outside of a couple. And the thing is, I feel like the Ravens in Week 18 versus Steelers have to play some of their guys because the last time they had the bye week and they were uh, playing the Titans in the divisional rounds, they were not ready to play after two weeks off, basically. And so while they got that win, it was also a Week 17 matchup then versus Doug Hodges. I feel like there is a, a clear thing when you get the bye week. Having two weeks off can really lead to some rust. And I feel like with Baltimore, they should not be too comfortable with where they're currently at, knowing we have yet to prove or redeem ourselves for past playoff disappointments. What do you think about that? I think it's fair, but I still wouldn't risk injury. I still wouldn't play anybody. Right. It's the injury question, but you need Roquan healthy. You need Kyle Hamilton healthy. That defense makes that team go. And you can't risk any of your top guys, your corners, uh, Matabuki, who I keep pronouncing his name wrong. Hopefully Matibuke. I'm getting it right. Say it again, John. Matabuke. Matabuke. You cannot risk injury to any of these players. Kyle Hamilton didn't even play against the Dolphins. And their defense was able to do that. I mean, Kyle Hamilton, when he's in the game, is such a game changer. He should be an all-pro this year. I think with all this Lamar Jackson MVP talk, which I know this was the topic of you know what we're talking about, but we, we kind of really do forget that, well, this defense is – one of the best that we've seen in recent years. The number one. And I agree with you. I wouldn't play the defensive players, but with the offense, I think you should play Lamar for a quarter and a half personally, because the, watching that Titan game, it felt like, you know, really two weeks off is not that beneficial. I think one week is fair. I, I Listen, you have a basis for why you say that. And I think that it's fair. Maybe you should just, Throw Lamar Jackson out there with the backup receivers, you know, Devin DuVernay and right. Nelson Aguilar, and just, you know, throw them out there and see what, what he does with those guys. When looking at the AFC, should the Ravens be a clear front runner, or do you think it's probably a little bit more divided between these top three or four teams? I think right now they should be the clear front runner. I think that there are less question marks about them than other than any other AFC team. I don't trust the Dolphins. The Browns are a dangerous team, but Joe Flacco's turnovers can very well cost the Browns a game in the playoffs. The Bills very up and down, but you know I think they can they should show up. But we saw last year versus the Bengals in the playoffs they did not show up. The Chiefs, I'm not counting them out. They have an elite defense still, and Mahomes is going to be Mahomes. Mahomes, people forget that he's number one in playoff passer rating. Ever in the playoffs, he's even better than than in the regular season, and I think that same story will follow itself in the postseason. So the top two teams for me are the Ravens, are the Chiefs. I've kind of given up on the Jaguars at this point. Yeah, and the Texans have a very outside chance, but I think that you know they're too young of a team. So I think it's Chiefs and Ravens one and two for me. <sighs> the Ravens are. One in one in three versus Patrick Holmes and the Chiefs. They're only one coming in 2021. That was a shootout. When looking at the AFC, I think it's a 1A with Andy Reid and the proven Kansas City Chiefs. You feel like in the postseason, Andy's going to have a trick under his sleeve. Maybe it's a bit like Chris Paul. It's like, how much does he have under the you know, under that play sheet that he hasn't actually showed his hand in with the regular season play? And then I think 1B would be Baltimore. And I, I do want to clear up and clarify what I just said before. Lamar did actually play well in that Titan game, had 130 rushing yards, part of 143, actually. The issue was Derrick Henry kind of had 195, and though Tannehill completed just seven passes in that matchup, Baltimore's defense could not contain an immovable force in, in King Henry. And with Kansas City, I feel like the same thing can be said. Rasheed Rice is at almost 1,000 yards. Travis Kelsey is a elite tight end. And you've got multiple different running backs. Jerick McKinnon can step up if he's healthy. Kansas City should be one of the two favorites in the AFC. And then I think the second tier is just the Browns. And quite frankly, I think that's it. I think maybe the Bills can be put in that tier. 
But them, the Dolphins, and the Jaguars should probably go in tier number three where they're not as serious as Cleveland because they have a top three or four defense. And quite frankly, their pass rush and pass defense is in the type of position to shut down Baltimore or Kansas City. I think Kansas City, though, right now is getting way too much hate because we're all tired of them. And they are still the sleeping giant that uh, can be awakened pretty quickly. And I, um, if I were to see them play Baltimore, I'd still favor them. If Kansas City's on the road, I would feel comfortable in that cold weather climate. They could, in a hostile environment, still go to the Super Bowl this year. I think the 49ers should win it all this year. They're the most talented team. And I think the NFC path, path for them is going to be pretty easy. There has been no team outside of the Rams, in my opinion, that have actually given them a matchup. Right. The The Niners should make it. If the Niners don't make it, we're, we all know what the biggest reason why is going to be. And if they don't win it all, we know what the biggest reason why is going to be. Well, there's two reasons. I think their offensive line is part of it, and the quarterback is the other part. It is kind of crazy, though, that out of all the teams in the NFC, many of which have been propped up this year, it is the division rival that has seven losses, or you know, they're a frisky wild card team that if anyone's gonna upset them, probably gonna be the one quarterback with a championship, the offensive play designer who can kind of surprise a lot. I think people forgot Sean McVay is in that territory as a top three or four coach. Mm -hmm. And they have all of the same characters as that Super Bowl run, primarily. And you add in a Pukunakoa, you add in a top ten running back. It does feel like the Rams here could have a little bit of that spark that Dallas does not have. At least you don't really trust them. And, and Philadelphia definitely does not have. I mean, Philadelphia's defense is a train wreck, and their offense is poorly coached. I think Philadelphia is far away the most clear pretender in the NFL. Yeah. But I would agree with you. I mean, the NFC, it, it's really just one team. And, and then the AFC, there's like four. Well, thank you for being on, John. It's going to do it for this episode of the Joel Moran Show. I appreciate you for being on the show, John. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And um, slowly becoming a, a Knicks defender here. So, <laughs> You guys can follow the podcast on the Pick Aside channel. These segments will be up on my personal channel on the Joel Moran YouTube channel. And if you would so kindly do, you know, rate the podcast five stars on Spotify. It helps the podcast a lot. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you guys next time. Peace.